All right, my name is uh, Nick Merker. I'm a, an attorney from Ice Miller in Indianapolis, and I'm going to talk today about 2012 privacy trends. And uh, as a lawyer, I'm going to talk, I hope I don't bore anyone, but I'm going to talk about some kind of issues that I think exist in privacy law today in the United States and some hopefully steps that are going to be taken soon to fix those issues. So about me, the obligatory bio page, but uh, feel free to add me on Twitter if you want to read my tweets about uh, issues with Comcast or me trying to get a refund with a garlic press um, from Crate and Barrel. I'm not very active on Twitter. Um, but I have a, I, I kind of wanted to put this slide up because I wanted to describe why I get into law and why I think this, uh, this privacy discussion is, uh, is kind of related to that. Uh, I was originally in IT. I worked for a major dot com for five years in Chicago as a systems network and security engineer. And before that, I worked uh, at NCSA at U of I. And before that, it, uh, while I was at U of I in college, uh, was when Napster got that first injunction that kind of really uh, destroyed it. And as, as a CS major at the time, all of my friends wanted to make the next Napster. And so we all kind of dove into the injunction, what happened, and what were they doing that uh, had this happen to them? And how can we create something that will get around what just happened? So at U of I, that was, that was the topic of, of the day. And as, as a student there, I really tried to dive into that and follow the case. And I realized pretty quickly that lawyers did not understand, for the most part, lawyers did not understand the technology that they were applying laws to. And more importantly, legislators didn't understand the technology as they were writing laws. So as a student uh, kind of in this field, I thought that you know I could eventually create a little uh, area of law where I, I, I could apply my technical intelligence to, to the law. That was my goal. Um, and privacy specifically, I think, is one of the most broken areas of the law today in the United States. That, um, I, and I think it's that exact situation. You have lawyers, judges, and legislators all trying to work with laws on technology they don't understand. Now, before I kind of get into why there are issues with privacy laws today, I, I want to first do a three a three minute little blip about um, no matter what privacy laws are created, no matter what standards are implemented, no matter what regulations are put forth to make businesses play nice in the privacy field, your biggest enemy from a privacy perspective is always going to be yourself. And I did something very stupid uh, last year regarding my Xbox Live account, where I was uh, my, I lost my Xbox Live account for a while. So this is my Xbox Live account, and I lost it because of a privacy issue. This is my Xbox Live account. I'm N Merker. Um, if you want to get me on Facebook, you go to facebook.com slash N Merker. You see the immediate relationship between my Xbox Live gamer tag and my Facebook URL. And because I'm not very bright, or I wasn't at the time, I had a lot of information on my Facebook page just publicly available to the internet. You could go find it um, just by typing in this URL. And I had things like my cell phone number, I had my address, I had my screen name, mercurygmail.com, I had other emails listed, I had everything you could possibly think of listed on here. Um, and partly I think that's because I didn't really care. I, you know, I want to share this with my friends, I want to share this with the world, I want, I want people to be able to contact me, that's great. But one of the issues was that with my Xbox Live account, if you type in the Nmerker Gamer tag, you get a reset your password link. And I can have it email me a reset link to merker at gmail.com. Well, you see kind of back here, uh, now I know that merker at gmail.com, even though they kind of tried to hide the, uh, the, the address there for me, because I have merker at gmail.com listed on my Facebook account, people know that this is where the, the reset link is going to be sent. Well, and then I did something else stupid. My Gmail account recovery secret question was, what is the name of my best friend from childhood? And this... This is just dumb on my part, but I also uploaded a photo uh, from a wedding that I participated in. And all of my friends were tagged in this photo. And these, like it says, are my closest friends. So I essentially gave anyone who wanted to know enough information to get into my Gmail account, which in turn would allow them to get into my Xbox Live account. And what happened was I also, because again, I had two credit cards uploaded to my Xbox Live account. And all in all, I got everything back. It was just a hassle. Uh, I had three weeks where I couldn't play on Xbox Live. But this just kind of, I wanted to kind of accentuate the point that if your biggest privacy enemy is yourself. So I'm going to talk about all these issues with the law, but your biggest enemy is yourself. Okay. 
So what is privacy in the United States? Here's your statistics slide. Um, the privacy in the United States is a big issue because consumers believe it's a big issue. And in this consumer report uh, survey, they, I think they tell from like 1,000 people, and 71% of people said they're very concerned about companies selling or sharing their information about them without their permission. That's a pretty stark number. And with 65% of smartphone owners worried that their smartphone app is going to do things that they said it wasn't going to do. And I think these two things alone really define uh, the magnitude of the issue in the United States because consumers realize it's an issue. It's not just 10% uh, of people thinking there's a problem. Enough consumers realize it's a problem that we have to move in a direction to fix whatever the problem is. And also, from what is privacy in the United States? Uh, this is the boring uh, part, of the, part of the presentation where I think there are two categories of privacy in the United States. There's one, privacy from the government. And this is important in that we're kind of unique from the rest of the world where privacy in America is an implied right from the government. And most everyone knows the Fourth Amendment, protection from unreasonable searches and seizures. And that gets its teeth when, uh, with a reasonable expectation of privacy. So the government can't come in and in investigate my life where I have a reasonable expectation of privacy without probable cause or a search warrant. And in these situations, it's been from case law, we've figured out that you have no expectation of privacy in your trash. You have no expectation of privacy in your publicly viewable windows. You also have no expectation of privacy from having a dog come up and sniff your car to see if your drugs in your car. And case law has kind of defined what this means. Um, and then there's also, but applying this to a technology situation, you see there's a circuit split here where uh, the 11th Circuit in one case two years ago said that you have no privacy right in email delivered to a third party. So if I send someone an email, I have no privacy right in where that email gone, has gone and the government can investigate that. What in another situation in the 10th Circuit, there's, they, they said that there's a privacy right in emails held by an ISP. So from a government perspective, I think the brick and mortar applications of expectation of privacy is pretty, uh, pretty clear cut. But when you get into the starting to apply uh, those concepts to technology, it's where the water gets a little more muddy. And this, this is kind of accentuating the point in that this is from a recent case, January 23rd of 2013. This is a concurrence. But what, what, what she's saying here, this is a Supreme Court decision, what she's saying here is that um, the digital age has kind of completely turned privacy on its head. And that people may not, today, people, today the kind of jurisprudence says that you don't have an expectation of privacy in what you give out to the public. But for me, with my Xbox Live situation, I gave all that information out to the public because I wasn't bright, but still, I, I didn't want you know, some malicious person to, to steal that information. I didn't, I didn't want the government to use that information to build some case against me. I, I had an expectation of privacy in that information, even though it was available publicly, as crazy as that sounds. And I think that's kind of what she's saying. And she dives into that further by saying that, clearly, you wouldn't want the government to monitor every URL that you uh, browse on the internet. Uh, and I, I think that's pretty, that's pretty clear cut. So on the other side of the coin, that is what privacy means uh, from a government standpoint. You have this implied right. Now, what privacy means from a uh, business to business and consumer to business interaction, I think is a little different and very, very unique in America. Um, and because we don't talk about you having a fundamental privacy right as a consumer to protect your information, what we talk about is what rights can a third party do with information that they have about me? So it, you, you flip the question around. And here are two examples from Facebook and Twitter's terms of use. And essentially, they're saying, whatever you put on our site, we can do whatever we want with it. And Facebook actually um, has, I cut out a little bit of language here to kind of stress my point. But Facebook has here kind of comma, uh, as long as it's according to your security setting. So, but you see here that they can do whatever they want. They can transfer. They can sublicense. They can give your, the content you give them to anybody. And so in the United States, there are some rules of the road, and there are some laws that kind of pertain to privacy here. But they're, they're categorical laws, and they only apply in certain situations. From a federal perspective, you have HIPAA for healthcare, you have uh, GLB for finance or collection situations, COPPA for children, uh, minors under the age of 13. If uh, you can't, as a business, you cannot collect uh, information about a 13-year-old or younger or under the age of 13 without an informed parent's consent. Um, then there's DPPA, no one ever talks about that, but that's with driver's license information. And then there's a myriad of state laws. So I want to stress that 
in America, we, we use this categorical approach that requires you to analyze facts in every situation to determine what laws apply to you. And this is completely different than the rest of the world. In the European Union, uh, on the other hand, they say data subjects or consumers have a fundamental privacy right. And that's really as, as far as they go. I mean, they, they define what that right is, but they don't have this categorical approach where, oh, well, they have a right in healthcare information, but, you know, not in first name, last name type situation. They say, no. And any personal information about a data subject, you have a fundamental right to that information. And it's a much easier application. And I think that's one of the problems with America's system, which I, I'll describe in further. And what, what America's system does is it creates, forces people to create these privacy policies that have no meaning. And so under some certain state laws, California law, for example, requires you as a website owner, if you collect information about uh, California residents, to put up this privacy policy. Laws in Pennsylvania, California, and Nebraska prohibit you from misrepresenting uh, your, your practices in a privacy policy. The FTC also has power uh, to go after deceptive trade practices. And if you're lying in a privacy policy, the FTC can come after you. So that's why privacy policies exist. And what we want privacy policies to be is a true disclosure of the privacy practices of a website. As a consumer, if I go to a website and I, I give them my first name, last name, email address, credit card number, social security number, all this information, I want to be able to look at a guide and have them explain to me what they're going to do with that information. And that was, I mean, if you look at California's law, that's, uh, well, if you, if you look at California's law, that's, that's what the law wants you to do. They want you to disclose your practices so consumers can make informed decisions. But that's not what's happening. Um, Privacy policies have kind of devolved, de-evolved into just a canned solution. Uh, most people just will either copy a privacy policy from another website, or they will uh, take an already form privacy policy template from somewhere and just stick it on their website. And they, they won't really put any decision making into what is said in that privacy policy, and it really doesn't disclose their practices. And there, I think there's four reasons why this is happening. First off is that you have state laws and the FTC who punish misrepresentation. So uh, with the laws, you can't lie in your privacy policy. So because of that, you don't want to make statements that you can't prove. Two, you don't want to create a promise in a privacy policy. Like, I, I don't want to say, hey, uh, information that you upload to my website is secure. Don't worry about it. Uh, we're not, nothing's bad is going to happen. I don't, I don't want to do that because I imply that I'm not going to have a security breach. So I have to kind of... Uh, massage my language there. There's customer backlash. If you remember, Google changed their privacy policy. They went from 60 down to 1, and they really streamlined their process, and I thought it was great for consumers, but they got a lot of backlash about it. People didn't understand what they were doing. Uh, people just were generally against it because they started combining information for multiple products, and you see that so Google, I, I think it was a tough road for them to do what was the right thing to do in that privacy situation. And then there's also this Facebook versus FTC settlement from last year where, the fa where Facebook, uh, essentially, so if you joined Facebook in 2003, you put up all this information, and they had in their privacy policy at the time, we're not going to give your information to third-party advertisers. You don't go to Facebook ever again. But in 2009, Facebook updates their privacy policy and says, hey, we're going to give your uh, information to third-party advertisers who may contact you, sorry. And you didn't consent to that. You've never been to Facebook again. But Facebook's new privacy policy, they say, oh, and this is retroactive to anyone. And the FTC came back and said, no, you can't do that. So now uh, the FTC has said that if you want to reduce the rights of your data subjects or your customers, you have to get their consent. So I think these four things playing with each other are really ruining privacy policies and making them almost nonsensical in, for, for most businesses. Um, so most of them say, hey, we collect information. Uh, we collect personally identifiable information, like your name when you sign up for an account. Um, we collect non-personally identifiable information, like when your computer accesses our site, we pull HTTP header information. We also log the date and time and pages you go to, and we look at your referring URL and that, all that stuff. And uh, we may or may not give that information to ev everyone. Uh, usually privacy policies have a big, long section where they say, we'll give out your information if we're required to under the court of law. We'll give out your information if somebody asks us and uh, we feel that it's in our best interest to give it out. Well, what does that mean? Uh, we'll give it out in the event that um, we want to have direct marketing solicitation to you or to third-party advertisers. And there's all these disclosures that basically, at the end of the day, say, we'll do whatever we want with your information at the end of the day. We'll give it to anybody. Uh, we don't spam. We use cookies. Just general 
boring statements that don't tell you anything. And usually, these aren't just three words, like in my situation here, they're full paragraphs explaining what cookies are and how cookies can tailor the site so we can track you and we can give you the content that you want to see. And stuff that, it's just, anyone who reads that, it, it doesn't tell me what they're going to do. It says, this is what a website could do with a cookie, essentially. And same with the spam uh, situation. And then there's always, my favorite section, the security section, where it usually says, uh, we try to protect the information that, that, that you give us. We use commercially reasonable efforts to protect that information, but sorry, nothing can be 100% secure. Um, you're giving us stuff at your own risk. And then they kind of, then they leave it at that. And then they also have, of course, the we can modify this policy at any time, and if you have any comments, let us know. So that's kind of a template privacy policy, and I didn't, after I explained that out, there's no way you have any idea what type of business I'm running. And the only thing that sometimes is included that uh, I didn't disclose here is if it's a, a financial situation like a transaction, an online shopping cart, you'll talk about financial information and what you do with that credit card information sometimes. But for most businesses, this is kind of the, what a privacy policy looks like today, and I don't think it's very helpful. Um, now, I, as an attorney, I craft a, a lot of privacy policies, and I try to avoid this uh, skeletal language, this template-type business, and try to actually convey what the, what the client is doing. But uh, sometimes that's hard to do while trying to factor in those four elements I discussed above, where I can't misrepresent the client, I can't uh, lie, I can't... Uh, I have to have a broad enough policy where if my client changes their practices, we don't have to get everyone's consent. So you just, I think, I think good folks try to avoid this situation, but I think this happens more, than, more often than not. So how do we fix it? Uh, the EU is taking steps through something called the EU Cookie Directive, and I, you probably haven't seen this in a privacy policy if, if you look at privacy policies, but I think this is really cool. This is the uh, Information Commissioner's Office in the United Kingdom. And what they have done is, in their cookie section, they don't just say, hey, we use cookies. They've blown it out, and they uh, describe the name of the cookie, uh, what it'll look like, its purpose, and more information that you can click on to learn more about the cookie. And the reason that they're doing this is because of an EU cookie directive. So uh, the EU passed this directive and requiring all of its member states to implement a law that uh, I believe it requires you to get informed consent for any client-side tracking objects, like a cookie or, a, or a, uh, any, any client-side tracking object, but they're calling it the EU cookie directive. So as, as you see here, I think this is, this is a step in the right direction because anybody could look at this and completely understand what's going on, assuming that there aren't any uh, misrepresentations in here. But I can look at this and go, oh yeah, okay, I, I understand what they're doing with all these cookies, I agree with those practices, I, I understand, I feel comfortable. Whereas what I talked about before, it was just, hey, we use cookies, and cookies can do this. So I, th I think this is a step in the right direction. But that said, this has no application to United States business, most United States businesses. Um, some U.S. businesses that either through EU safe harbor or modern model contracts or some situation are required to comply with this directive. But for the most part, U.S. businesses, uh, this doesn't matter at all. So another way that we're kind of fixing it is that the FTC, as, as I discussed before, which I actually thought was a little bit of a negative, um, they're going out and trying to uh, set precedent and really go after folks that are uh, participating in unfair business practices. So you, you kind of look at uh, these examples here. One is from Google Buzz. I don't know if you heard about that last year, but with Google Buzz, essentially, Google put up this new product, and they said, hey, do you want to use Google Buzz? If you clicked yes, great, you were enrolled in Google Buzz. If you clicked no, uh, the FTC alleged that you were still using Google Buzz. People were still seeing that you're on the system. You're still seeing Google Buzz notices and things of that nature. And the FTC said, well, you, you can't do that. You can't have, you can't have an opt-out or an opt-in situation where they click no and they're still opted in is essentially what the, they're arguing. And also in this rock you situation on the left, that was more from a security side where they're saying, you weren't employing commercially reasonable security practices. Here's the things that weren't commercially reasonable. So another huge issue, and I think this is bigger than the first privacy policy issue, is the situation of state breach notification laws. Um, so how many people have actually received a state breach, or a, a breach notification law, whether it be an email or a letter saying, yeah, we, we lost your information, um, and we're sorry, but Here's, here's what you can do, here's some information that you can freeze your credit or whatever. Um, so this is PlayStations from uh, last year. 
Sony's from last year. So the, the problem here is that there are 46 states that have acted state breach notification laws involving personal information. Now, there's no over, overarching federal law. So any time that there is a breach uh, of personal information, you have to look at these state laws. And the state laws only cover the individual residents of the state. So why is this an issue? Well, this is an issue because you ha anytime there's a breach of a website that operates nationally, where I have, let's say, one account of uh, a person in each state on my website, I now have to look at 46 different laws in order to figure out how I can comply with each of them when sending out breach notifications to my customers. And a problem is that the laws define personal information differently where in this example from Missouri, uh, first initial and last name plus social security number is personal information. There are some laws that include first name, uh, last name, and a birthday in combination as personal information. And it's just, it, it, it's different state by state, and you have to kind of look at each law in order to determine whether a breach is an actual breach of personal information. And there'll be some situations where it's a breach in one state's law, but not another state's law. Um, and also in North Carolina, some, here's another example where they're kind of saying, defining it through the negative side by saying this is not personal information. Another issue is that each state law requires you to uh, conform to the, uh, when you actually give the notification out, you have to include different information. So in this example, again, from North Carolina, you have to include all this stuff um, in, when you send out a breach notification to North Carolina. In Illinois, for example, you have to include only a part of this information. In Indiana, I don't believe you have to include any of it. In some other states, you have to include more stuff. So when you're, when you're starting to compose and tackle this breach notification issue, you have to look at each law, not only to determine if you have a breach, but also to determine what you have to include as information in your notification to your consumers. And now here's the telling thing, is that most states have no requirement for what to include. So a, a simple email that says, uh, hey, we lost your stuff, sorry, um, talk to you later. That, that could be acceptable under some state laws, which tells the customer nothing. And another issue is that if, if I am a Nick company and you sign up for a, an account with me and then I sell your information to a third party who's named Bob Company, you're going to get, and Bob Company has a breach, you're not going to get a breach notification from me. You're going to get a breach notification from Bob Company. You may have no idea how, what, what information Bob Company had, how Bob Company got your information, or anything. So you just get a breach notification from Bob Company that says, hey man, uh, lost your info, sorry, talk to you later. And you don't know what even happened. You don't know what information is out there in the wild. And I, th I think that's a, a very big issue because there's not enough transparency about what's going on under some of the state laws. Yeah. Is the state law about like telling Yes. Uh, and it varies, again, state by state. Most of, most of them, uh, they don't, I can't think of any off the top of my head that create private causes of action. So as a consumer, you can't go after the company. But in most situations, the attorney general would have some sort of ability to go after the company and uh, seek statutory damages if it's defined in the, uh, in the, in the law itself or some, some other remedy. Most of it is uh, per, it, again, very state by state, but the ones that are coming off the top of my head are per day in violation past when you should have disclosed. And the fines are pretty steep. Um, so, the, and, and this is, uh, again, most states don't have a requirement of what actually happened. Okay, so another issue is timing. And that, this is the Sony example again. They didn't, Sony didn't send out emails to their customers until, April 26th of 2011, when the actual breach started April 17th of 2011. That's nine days. In nine days, what, what could someone have done with my credit card information that was stored on the PlayStation Network? A whole hell of a lot. And I, I think the whole timing thing is a problem. It may be a necessary problem, but almost every statute allows you some amount of time to reasonably investigate the scope of the breach, who's affected, what's affected, and uh, to form your notification strategy. And actually, Sony's nine days in this situation, which I was trying to say is a long time, is actually pretty quickly as compared to other entities. Uh, Sony, they're getting major backlash from the, uh, from the community, so they kind of got their act together. But most laws only say the disclosure will be made without reasonable de delay. And that really, one, doesn't tell you a whole lot, and two, is kind of open to interpretation. What, what is an unreasonable delay? 
So in my opinion, we're breached out. And I say that because I've received six breach notifications this year, two of which from companies that I didn't even know. And on top of that, how many breach notifications have I missed that have gone in my spam folder because they're from companies I don't even know? Because, my, again, my information was sold to a third party, and that third party had some breach, and they notified me, and I, it went in my spam folder because I've never gotten an email from that company before. So I know of six, two of which were from businesses I didn't realize had my information. I guess those could have been phishing attempts or something, but I, I, I don't know. I, I've had a lot, and I'm sure you have as well, and you probably just delete them or just move on with life or don't even, don't even read them or they go on in, into your spam. And I, I think this is a problem where there are so many breach notifications out there that don't actually tell you anything, and they happen so frequently now that I don't think we learn uh, from this process at all. And we, can't, we don't defend ourselves after a breach because they're just, they happen so frequently. Another issue is that there are zero repercussions outside of industry backlash for a breach. Um, I guess from a PCI standpoint, uh, you know, the, pay, the payment card industry could say, okay, well, you had a breach that was so bad you didn't comply with any of our standards. We're going to take away your ability to process credit cards. But in most situations, nothing happens. I, I have a breach. I disclose it. And I go on with my day-to-day. -day. Maybe some customers get mad and quit, but for the most part, as a business, I'm fine. I complied with the law by sending out my notification, and now I'm moving on with life. And I, I, th I think that's an issue because it kind of, it doesn't force the company to learn from their mistakes. Um, now, in most situations, like for, for Sony, Sony is forced to learn from their mistakes because the industry, the market, is kind of forcing them to, to, be, uh, to kind of take these issues more seriously. But, so I, I think those are some issues with breach notification. And so there's a big privacy movement right now, and it started last year. Uh, in 2011 with um, Senator McCain and Senator, Senator Kerry kind of had this joint bill where it was, I, I believe it was something along the Privacy Bill of Rights and they put it in front of Congress and they were trying to you know, have an have a overarching federal law that controls personal information in all categories. So you don't have this categorical approach. Now that, that stuff would still exist, but this, this law would, would be more in line with the EU Data Protection Directive that I talked about before. Um, so your, your Congress is attempting these overarching bills, and the Department of Com Commerce is trying to be a player and requesting that Congress move forward with a privacy bill of rights, and the FTC is suggesting a do not track initiative, and the White House has actually released this privacy framework. Um, now, of course, none of this really matters. I mean, you can even see with the White House privacy framework, all they're saying is we're going to work with some folks to improve this process. We're going to work with Congress to do things better. And nothing has really happened yet, but there's, there's movement in the right direction. But here's my problem, and it goes back to my second slide on why I got into law. I don't think Congress gets it. And whether it's SOPA, PIPA, CISPA, or some other acronym that sounds like an anime love interest, I, I don't think they understand what they're doing from a technology perspective. And here's a big example, and this, this really frustrated me when I first read it. There is the Protecting Children from Internet Pornographers Act of 2011, uh, put forth by Lamar Smith, although the, the guy uh, behind SOPA. And this is a bill. It's not a law or anything yet. But uh, this, the goal of this bill would be to have increased penalties for uh, child pornography, uh, give warrant powers to, uh, to the government to go to ISPs and say, hey, this guy is dealing in child porn. We need to... You know, we need to find this guy right away, give us all the information you have. Um, and generally, I mean, on its face, the first three paragraphs of the bill, I was like, yeah, this is, this is good. This is doing the right thing. But then you get down to the fourth paragraph and how they're actually going to implement these new things. Uh, yeah? Uh, it, it, it is with a search warrant, but the, the way that they get search warrants is, yeah, the, the, the process under the bill gives them... Uh, quicker time in order to get a search warrant to do what they need to do. Uh, I'd have to read the exact text of the bill, but it increases their ability. Like before, right as it stands today, as an internet service provider, uh, as the government, I can go to an internet service provider and say, hey, hold your logs for 90 days. I'm coming with a search warrant soon, and I want to see your logs to catch, catch this child pornographer guy. And an ISP will comply, and they'll hold the logs for 90 days. And then eventually I get a search warrant, I come in and, and take care of it. This situation is different in that it forces ISPs to hold that information, the IP to person uh, mapping, for a period of one year. And it also requires you to hold financial information used to pay for internet service for a period of one year. 
So now we're past the point of I, as a government, have to request you as the ISP to hold records for me. You're already doing that for a period of one year by law, if this was passed. And now I have the ability to, to come after and uh, issue warrants to search warrants to get that information. Yeah. Yeah, well, so this specific bill doesn't go that far. It doesn't go, you're talking about if uh, the government would be looking at URLs you're hitting and stuff. Yeah, things. Like, like everywhere. Yeah, that, that. The, the bill doesn't talk about that specifically. What it's talking about is, so the government, this is a situation that they, that they want to stop. So the government finds this website with a bunch of child pornography on it. And they, uh, and, the, and they look at the logs, the access logs of the website, and they see, oh, eight months ago, this IP address downloaded this picture. Okay. And then now they want to be able to go to the ISP and say, ISP, eight months ago, give me the name of the person with this IP address. That's what this bill wants to do. Um, they're not looking to uh, issue warrants to get you know, what, what URLs you've, you've hit in the last three weeks or anything like that. Uh, they're just more trying to get an IP to human translation. Yeah. Yeah, they define, uh, I forget the word used in the bill, but I don't think it would cover a, a business like you're describing. Because they, they define uh, ISPs, kind of generally people that provide internet service. And I guess they, they can make an argument. This is still a bill, so how, what actually would mean if it became law would be in, uh, interpreted by the courts. But uh, I think you can make an argument that as an employer, you're providing internet access and you would fall under the bill. But I, I don't know. I think that kind of is a stretch of the text. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> but here, here's my privacy issue with this bill. My, my issue is that you're creating a honeypot for uh, breaches. You're, you're requiring ISPs to hold information to hopefully, possibly catch a very, very, very small amount of people doing bad things. And I, I think that's a huge overstep of what needs to be done in this situation. Because how often is it the situation where the government finds these types of websites that have logs that go back eight months, and they go, yeah, we got him, because we had this one bill that was put into a law now. We can get this guy. Whereas when they, in most situations, find this website and just start actively monitoring who goes uh, to the site in time and get a list of people actively participating in child pornography instead of trying to go back and use this bill as a, as a, as a shoehorn to, to do it for them. So my problem with this bill is what, what, if this is enacted into law, what other, types of, uh, what other types of privacy kind of, you know, last paragraph items are going to be attached to bills in similar fashions? Or what, what could this information uh, be used by the government or by third parties or whatever. How, how could this information now required to be held by law, how could it be used for purposes outside of the scope of the bill? And that's kind of my issue, and that's why I don't think Congress gets it. Um, I'm not even going to talk about SOPA, PIPA, and CISPA because I think it's been uh, beaten so badly that everyone understands why this is a major problem. But I, I will say that I don't think that Congress has learned their lesson and they're going to keep trying to uh, enact laws that don't really make a lot of sense for the technology that they're being applied to. Now that said, I'll kind of go back one slide to this slide where you have a lot of folks interested in this. A lot of business leaders now uh, realize this is a big issue. You saw my first slide talking about um, you know, 71% of consumers think this is a huge deal. Uh, the FTC is trying to get involved. The White House is involved. So I think eventually uh, the right people can, can get together and hopefully do something that will uh, kind of put us more in line with uh, maybe the EU or something better that's more consumer friendly. But as it stands today, I'm not really confident 
in, uh, in, in, in the way things are going right now. And so my conclusion, I guess that should have been the slide when I was talking now, but in inclusion, it's kind of a face palm at this point, and hopefully it will be fixed uh, in the future. So I, I, I would love to answer any sort of questions you have. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm an intellectual property attorney, so if you have patent copyright trademark questions or you have general privacy questions, uh, I would love to, uh, to answer those questions for you. So uh, whether you want to put, uh, phrase them here now or uh, you can come up and talk to me afterwards is completely up to you. Yeah. Uh, with regards to the, uh, the retaining price for IP drug patents and all that, um, I, I doubt this, but did they actually go to ISP like Comcast and some of your providers and say, how would you generally do IP anyway? You know, does Comcast already keep them for a year by default and they're trying to work out that model, or are they really pushing the envelope here for something that would, would normally be like a month at a major ISP? Yeah, and I don't know the exact answer to that, but I do know that when this bill was first introduced in 2011, part of it was that uh, a, a group would go out into the industry and figure out how much money this is going to cost the industry. And that was one of the, I don't know why that was such an important part of the bill, but so they, they, they did that, and it was a relatively low cost. Uh, I forget how much it was, but it was a relatively low cost. So I think that kind of goes to your argument that maybe ISPs are already keeping this information for longer th than we think. But... From, from my standpoint, it isn't w whether the market is kind of almost doing that right now. It's that now they're forced to do it, uh, to try to solve a problem that was only slightly uh, helped by that process, is, was my argument. Are there any other questions at all? Great. Well, yeah. Right. So you appear to now are Senator Parker. <laughs> That's that's really that, that that's the problem. Yeah, that's that's really a problem because and and that's why I think it was named like that uh, because it's very hard to speak out against to vote against a bill that has stop child pornography in the title. It really is, and it and I also believe that's why stop the SOPA bill was named Stop Online Privacy Act and PIPA was well I don't know. Pippa's name wasn't that great, but they try to name these bills in such a way where you're going to look like an idiot if you're speaking out against it. Or, and on the other hand, you're not really going to read the text of the bill, but you know by the title this is the Stop Online Privacy Act, and you're going to vote with it because that's, that's what you believe in. So I think there's a lot of gamesmanship there with, with titling as well. Like, I don't know, Patriot perhaps? Yeah, the Patriot Act, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would first ask them if they've ever been on Wikipedia. The answer will be yes. And then the uh, question after that is, well, do you realize this bill would essentially destroy how Wikipedia functions today? And when they go, oh, I, know, I don't, okay, could you explain that to me? Then you can just kind of go into the, the spiel where user content now could create a situation where the government can shut down a website because users are putting up infringing materials. Without giving the time, without giving the website time to police themselves or whatnot, it's just the accusation is enough to shut down a site, and that's web web 2.0 completely relies on user content. Uh, whether it's a simple news site in your hometown that they post a dumb story and they collect feedback from the community, most of the community cares more about the comments than the actual story itself. So we're, we're driven by user comments, and those bills tried to make it user comments actually a way to bring down websites instead of promoting the internet. That's, that's kind of what I would leave with. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. And what's, what's interesting, and I saw some, I won't dive into this too far, but I saw some analysis where 
uh, a lot of those sites, you use the uh, Facebook API to pull those, pull those comments onto your site. So if I'm Nick Merker's web page and I'm pulling in Facebook comments through their API and I'm just displaying it right there, would they be coming after me because I'm displaying this infringing material through Facebook comments? Or would they be going after Facebook? And it kind of seems like it's, it's a disconnect on what actually would happen. And if, it, if it's the former, I think that's a big problem because I have no control over Facebook comments. I can control my actual user comments, or I can control, I guess, having the uh, Facebook contact on my page. But I can't control Facebook. I'm not, I'm not Facebook. So. Sure. In a broader sense, for the free stuff cases that you were talking about earlier, you know, like Dave, um, one thing that I always kind of stuck out to me was like, I think they cover it at a data at all to a certain reasonable level. Yeah. You don't have to notify <laughs> in those cases. Um, is that kind of how things are still trending that you can notice in the state state as, as new notification uh, laws come out of yeah, I, I think that's the way. I, I won't talk about it like new breach notification laws because I think we're kind of set. I, I'm talking about it more of the federal laws uh, that are kind of in discussions right now, I think would echo that same sentiment. Uh, because what they don't want to have is I have my iPhone here and I have probably contracts from clients with, uh, with you know, information that would constitute a breach. If I leave this in a taxi cab and uh, under a law that kind of removes that encryption language, uh, I, would, I may have to disclose that I you know, lost this cell phone. And from a lawyer, I, I would have to disclose that to the client anyway. But from a normal business situation, how many of your uh, employees that you've seen or clients or whatever have been in that situation where they left a laptop somewhere or a, a cell phone? And so they want to be able to protect themselves with things like BitLocker and uh, that the iPhone is now using encryption and things of that nature. They want to be able to have those defenses. So if I do something stupid, I don't have to disclose it to everyone when all it is is all it is is a left cell phone in a taxi cab. Which, I don't, if that, is that the right thing? I don't know, but that's kind of why that language is there. The, most of the state laws say that if, if there is a breach or you reasonably believe that there was a breach, so that would, that would speak to the latter one. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think that would be a very close call to really depend on the facts. Like, where, where was the phone when it was out of your control? Was it sitting in a lost and found bin in a taxi uh, cab office? Or was it, you know, completely misplaced and someone just happened to come by and drop it in your lap as you're sitting in a park bench or something? You know, the latter situation is more like there may have been a breach here where the former is like, eh, it's in a lost and found bin. So I, I think it really depends on um, the fact situation. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, sure. This is going to deviate a little bit from the topic, but thank you for making a great talk. Can you talk a little bit about the honors and the state spot with the foreign partners and the world? Yeah, it's. Uh... I think you probably saw recently where a court uh, a court denied um, what was it? I forget if a court denied a, an employer's request. No, no, no. And a court came down on an employer that was forcing uh, an employee to open up their Facebook account for hire for the employer. Um, so that situation happened. But uh, I know there was a case where a uh, a court ordered a girl actually to uh, decrypt her hard drive in a in an evidence in a discovery situation. And I, I would imagine, uh, I haven't been following that cl case as closely as I probably should have, but I would imagine that's something that will be appealed because that's, that's very, very new ground. Uh, and it's something that I'm not sure. I understand the court's reasoning, but, uh, and she has a very interesting argument from the Fifth Amendment, uh, kind of she doesn't want to incriminate herself by giving her a password, which I, I think is a pretty cute argument. But uh, I, I think that's something that will have to be, they'll have to be appealed and uh, figured out in the courts. But. Oh, did they? Oh, well, the, dang. So that's now that's not going to be figured out. Well, that's terrible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, that's a problem because the court can then say, well, you're lying. I'm going to hold you in contempt until you provide this information. And then if you're trying to avoid 
uh, giving away information that will send you to jail, well, you may have just sent yourself to jail because of contempt. Like if you remember uh, the Barry Bonds case uh, a while ago where he was, they were trying to get somebody to testify whether Bonds had taken steroids or not, and he refused to testify. Well, they held him in jail for, what was it, 10 years or something ridiculous. Yeah. So those contempt-type situations are stuff I don't think you want to play around with as a... I, I, I don't know. I, that's, that litigation side is not really my, my expertise. Uh, I would hope so, but I, I don't really know. Uh, and that makes sense. Are there any questions at all? I'd love to stick around. Uh, I'm going to probably get some coffee upstairs, so I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Uh, so please feel to uh, reach out to me. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>